I'm really happy to have this chance to share with you all about Frances Callister. I first read her journals when I joined the Arboretum Board in 2018, and that was the same year, I believe, that the Pioneer Museum had their Women of Resilience in Flagstaff exhibit. And when I read the journals, I thought, dang, I missed the boat. Frances should really have been included in this presentation about resilient women of Flagstaff because she certainly was that. And, but fast forward three years and the book, uh, the journals have been reissued. Uh, and uh, I, now I have this chance to share in a Zoom presentation at Reardon Mansion. So who could have thought? Uh, so thanks again for giving me this opportunity. And if there's anyone in the audience who's not familiar with Frances McAllister, she was a remarkable woman who was born in 1910 in California. She didn't move to Flagstaff until she was in her mid fifties, but she had a tremendous impact on Flagstaff during the second half of her life. She founded the Arboretum. She was one of the first people to work with the Head Start program in the late 60s in Flagstaff. She trained uh, some of our local teachers to work with the preschoolers. In 1983, she was named Tree Farmer of the Year by the Arizona Forestry Commission. That was a surprise. <laughs> she founded the Quaker Friends Meeting House in Flagstaff. She was not born into a Quaker family, but she became a Quaker when she married John McAllister. Frances was the first woman to serve as a board member for the Flagstaff Symphony Association, which is probably almost all women now. She was the president of the Museum of Northern Arizona Board of Trustees, and she did so much more. Here's a picture of Frances receiving one of many honors. This one was taken when she was 94 years old So she was born outside Los Angeles to a working class couple and they had neither one of them had graduated from high school. And she went on to become one of Flagstaff's most influ influential women. Her mother worked as a secretary. Her father was a cook. So Frances was taken care of by her grandmother. Along with her sister, they had a good time in the backyard. They grew rhubarb and carrots and flowers. And that was pretty much the only um, formal training or informal training that Frances had in gardening it was from her grandmother in California. Frances's mother died when she was 14. And that was the first of many sorrows in her life. In her mid-teens, she got a job working 48 hours a week for $16 a week. She reports in her journal she was not allowed to sit down. She was, it was tough, but she did earn enough money to enroll in Glendale Community College and then UCLA. And in her philosophy class at UCLA, she met John Vickers McAllister. And six years later, they were married. Now, John came from a different kind of background than Francis did. His family was very wealthy. His parents came to Southern California around the turn of the century. And his grandfather was named John Vickers. He was one of the partners in the Chiricahua Cattle Company, which I guess is somewhat legendary. John Vickers was a Quaker, and he was moving from Midwest to Southern Arizona. And then after his um, career with the cattle company, he moved on to Southern California. But while he was with the cattle company, it was the time of the Apache raids and the Apache leader Geronimo was on the run. And I included this anecdote because it is Indigenous Peoples Day. And I wanted to give a nod to Geronimo so um, John Vickers, the Quaker, uh, saw that Geronimo was in trouble and somehow he offered Geronimo sanctuary in the barn at the cattle company. 
he would leave food and water outside the door and Geronimo stayed in that barn for several weeks and recovered from his wounds. And when he moved on and John Vickers went out to the barn, he saw that Geronimo had left two things as gifts for Mr. Vickers um, in gratitude for his hospitality. Those two items were a fetish and a basket. And in the mid 20th century, those items were um, given to Frances be, uh, from her in-laws because she was she had become a Quaker and because she was living in Arizona. And so she inherited those items and then late in life she donated them to MNA. So someday you might be able to see Geronimo's basket and fetish in a behind the scenes tour at the museum. So back to 1934 when Frances was 24 years old, her friend, John Vickers McAllister, asked her to chaperone his younger sister and a couple of, oh, one friend, his younger sister and one friend, take them on a grand tour of Europe before the girls started college. Frances was a recent college graduate herself, and she was only 24, but she was thrilled at this opportunity. So the four young people got on the train in Los Angeles and they took it to New York City, a multi-day trip. And of course that train came through Flagstaff. And back in those days, there were three trains a day in each direction running between Los Angeles and Flagstaff. So it, it was early morning when that train uh, rolled through Flagstaff and being the senior members of the party, John and Francis were up early and they were out back on the observation deck, I guess you'd say, and they looked around and saw how beautiful Flagstaff is in a, on a summer morning. And John was musing that he would like to buy some land in this area and build a cabin. And what he said to Francis, which was sort of a marriage proposal, he said, I'd like to have a cabin up here and we could take the train to Flagstaff on Friday, read manuscripts all day Saturday, make decisions on Sunday, take the night train back. So this would be a fabulous weekend getaway for the, those two people. And the manuscripts he was referring to were poetry submissions because John and Francis, having been philosophy majors, had started a little magazine called The Magazine. And it published uh, poetry from many uh, poets who wanted to be published. And they had some work to do with that, with that magazine. So Francis went on to take the girls to Europe. She turned 24 during that trip. They sailed back to New York. She dropped the girls off at college and she continued west on that four day train trip by herself. And when she reached LA, John was waiting for her at the station. And soon the cabin would come into being. They got married in 1936. And there's a picture of them, which is a passport picture. And I guess back in the day, you could get a joint passport with your spouse. And they continued to live in Los Angeles. But they spent many of their weekends, especially in the summer and fall, in Flagstaff, taking that train. So John had learned from his father and his grandfather the importance of buying land and what a wonderful investment that was. So he purchased many hundreds of acres of land along West Route 66 and Woody Mountain Road. And that became known as the McAllister Ranch. And he built that cabin in 1936 or he had people build it for him, I should say. And it looked kind of like this, but this act picture was actually taken about 10 years ago because the cabin 
which stood for 60 years in that area along West Route 66 and Woody Mountain Road. The cabin was moved in the 1990s, bit by bit. Uh, it was disassembled into 2,000 pieces. Each piece was tagged and it was uh, trucked down to the grounds of the Arboretum and reconstructed there. So this is how the cabin looks today on the grounds of the Arboretum. And a shout out to Mike Lovin for doing that, that uh, remarkable project at Francis's request, by the way. So here is a sign the city has in the works because they are hoping to develop the old buildings of the McAllister Ranch into kind of a walking tour area. It's just west of the new city public works yard and there's very handsome old buildings that predated the McAllister's purchase of the land. And so I'm really looking forward to having a, a walking path out there and some interpretive signs and, and so forth to keep the memory of this ranch and the McAllister's alive. So in her journals, Frances reports that she and John shared a love for 22 years until 1953 when he died. And Francis was then 43 years old, widowed very young with an adolescent son. He had a brain tumor for almost a decade. He was in and out of a sanitarium and it was, it was a very hard time for her. And she shares that in her journals, but she came out of the darkness eventually. She had her son, she could concentrate on her son. And the mother and son were still living in the Los Angeles area at that time. But they would spend their summers at the log house along West Street 66. They would explore the forest and they spent time on the Indian reservations. And Francis learned to really love and appreciate the plants of the Colorado Plateau. And when her son was young, Francis had volunteered at his school. She became very interested in early childhood education. And even though she had no formal training, remember she was a philosophy major, she got um, to be something of an expert in early childhood education and joined a national association. And she was invited to go to Washington for a conference on children. And she met the Nixons. This was before he was president. And she talked to them about her interest in preschool. And preschool was kind of a revolutionary idea, as I understand it, in 1960. And in her journals, Frances says that Mrs. Nixon said, oh no, it's wrong for mothers to turn their children over to teachers at such an early age. Women should not be working. They should stay home. And Frances pointed out to Mrs. Nixon that not all women had that option. And in fact, Frances's own mother worked 40 hours a week as a secretary. And that family was lucky enough to have grandma to take care of the kids, but society was changing. So John Jr. went off to college and Frances decided that she was done with Southern California and she wanted to simplify her life. She wanted to live in one place only, not have a winter home and a summer home. And she was really attracted to Flagstaff. And so she decided to build a new house that would be her permanent home in Flagstaff. And John had often visited his acreage along Woody Mountain Road and he had picked this one particular location that has a fabulous view of the peaks. And he said, Francis, that will be our home place someday. Well, of course, he did not live long enough to make that his home place, but she knew just where she wanted to build that house because of what John had shared with her. So this is a picture of the house early on. It looks a little bleak, but she started landscaping it and built home. And let me just mention that when John McAllister bought the acres that became the McAllister Ranch, 
and the Arboretum, he paid $4 an acre for that land. So here's the, pic here's the house today. Here it was in 1968, here it is today. So it's really uh, warmed up a lot. It's got a lot of color around it. And uh, Frances started a lot of that in her personal landscaping of the grounds. We call it the Walter Reichard House because that's the name of the architect that Frances knew from Los Angeles. And she engaged his services to design the house, which was is a mid-century house. And at that time, 1968, when it was built, it was state of the art, I guess. It seems kind of vintage now, but in a good way. So she moved into her new home in the very snowy winter of 1967 and 68. And soon she was landscaping with native plants. Now back then she could not go to Home Depot or even Warner's or Viola's to get native plants. She had to dig them up herself or hire somebody to do that. But she had plenty of acreage along Woody Mountain Road so she could um, transplant a lot of things. And in her journals, she recounts her landscaping. She said, we planted junipers and bristlecone pine. I guess she had to go up pretty high into the mountains to get that bristlecone pine. Red twig dogwood was one of her favorite plants. And you'll see it all over the Arboretum grounds today. And it's a nice red color in October too. And she put in two Colorado blue spruces in 10 gallon cans. And she fretted that this was a real extravagance to uh, buy plants in 10 gallon cans, but it paid off because those spruces are about 60 feet tall now. So she brought in the wildflowers from her own property and she reports in her journals that in good weather, she worked in the garden for two hours every day before breakfast. And she proudly reports that she dug up a red twig dogwood truck and she planted it right in her patio, surrounded by flagstones in 1967. And that plant is still there today and it's about five feet tall and it's doing great. So the first uh, gathering in her new house was in September 69 when she invited the Arizona Quakers, Quaker Association, maybe. Anyway, 90 Quakers from the state of Arizona from ages 9 to 90 came to the Arboretum and camped on the, the property there. And you can see from the house as you look north to the peaks that there's a beautiful meadow to the north, a sunny meadow. And I'm pretty sure that's where they did their camping. And that's called Sinclair Wash. So in 1972, Frances realized from her, one of her many connections in Flagstaff, and this connection was the Dean of the Forestry School, whom she, and she knew him through the Quaker Meeting House. His name was Charles Minor, and he advised Frances that her property was unhealthy, uh, the for, much of the forest was too thick, and that she should have it thinned. And so she hired several young men uh, students at NAU, and one of them, he, some of you might recognize the name Carl Carlstrom. He went, he's gone on to fame and fortune as a geologist uh, specializing in the Grand Canyon. So Carl and John Victoria and some other strapping young men uh, started thinning the thick dog hair forests uh, along Woody Mountain Road on Francis's land. And 25 years later, this fire started, and some of you might remember that. It was June of 2006, and the fire started along I-40 near Flagstaff Ranch Road, and it started traveling very fast to the northeast, and it, it crossed the pro some of the property that Francis had, had thinned 25 years earlier. And authorities are convinced that if that thinning had not been done, the town of Flagstaff could have burned down. But it, the fire was put out in one day. So Francis was um, 
well aware of this and she writes in her journals, she gives herself a pat on the back for saving the town of Flagstaff by her forward thinking pinning efforts in the studies. So she was something of a social activist and this fit in with her Quaker faith that she had uh, adopted from her husband, John McAllister and work with the Friends, which are the Quakers, took her to Washington to lobby and maybe even demonstrate for, against the war. And in 1973, Francis's name was placed on Nixon's enemies list. And there were only two people in Arizona on that list. As I can't recall the other one. Here's a picture of her in midlife. Nice. She was 57 at this time, and here she is at MNA at a, a rug auction. And she uh, was the president of the Board of Trustees at MNA for two consecutive terms. In 1983, the same year that she was named Tree Farmer of the Year for her thinning efforts, she was named Arizona Daily Sun Citizen of the Year. But when she was age 70, she knew it was time to make some changes. She was ready to move into town and she was ready to start distributing her money even more widely than she had. So she created a transition foundation because she was making a transition. Because she knew that the Ponderosa Pine Forest is called the transition zone of the Colorado Plateau. It's midway between the Alpine peaks and the um, lower elevation grasslands. So she liked that idea of transition. And she writes in her journals that she wanted to help various Flagstaff institutions to make their own transition to better serve their missions. She knew that Flagstaff itself was transitioning from a small mountain town to a cultural hub. And in 1995, when she was 85 years old, she went shopping for a telescope to donate to Lowell Observatory in honor of her husband, whose memory she carried with her constantly. As she bought a telescope from Northwestern University and had it shipped down to Flagstaff and housed it in a dome, which in it that is still there today. This probably looks familiar to many of you. And her husband, John, had loved the dark skies of Flagstaff. So this was purchased in his honor and named in his honor. And Francis foresaw that there would be too much development in Northern Arizona. And here's a picture of her when she's maybe 60 and a quote from her journals. She said, I saw a need for understanding the roles of, role of plants, flowers, shrubs, and trees because they were being replaced by ranches, roads, tourist facilities, and towns. And how right she was. So out of this transition foundation came the Transitional Zone Horticultural Institute, which is the legal name for the Arboretum at Flagstaff. So again, she used Transitional Zone because of the Ponderosa Pine Forest. And she wanted to promote the understanding and appreciation of the plants that grow in this transition zone. So here's a picture of the Arboretum today. She ended up donating 200 acres to the Transition Zone Horticultural Institute. And that, and that included her beautiful home, which is now the visitor center and a fabulous gift shop. So the grounds today are covered with mostly native plants. There are some plants that uh, come in, were brought in from other continents even. We have the um, Russian sage, which is native to the mountains of Pakistan. Some other plants that co might come from Europe or from Russia because Flagstaff has a climate not unlike Siberia sometimes with the hot summers and the cold winters, but 80% of our property is covered with native plants and children come to the Arboretum a lot. They come with their parents, but they also come for summer camps 
and field trips. And that certainly fits with Francis's vision of early childhood education. So Francis passed at age 98. She was in her four bedroom penthouse apartment at the Peaks. She had loved ones by her side. And the last line of the journals was written by her friend, Robin Cameron, who was there. And Robin says the breeze was gentle as Robert Brunig opened the window and we said goodbye to our good and faithful servant. So I have a short video that was made by a professional videographer, young man in Flagstaff. It'll last about 10 minutes and then we'll have a Q&A. The wonderful thing about the Arboretum is just this, to me, it's just a hymn to this place. If you really pay attention, you walk through the Arboretum and you just see this wonderful array of native plants. And so the idea is connecting people with the beauty and diversity of the native flora of this region and encouraging them to bring that into their own lives, to enrich their lives with the beauty, but also to connect them to the place at which they live. <laughs> The art is important because it gives us a knowledge and a, a visible representation of who we are as a landscape here in Northern Arizona, in the Colorado Plateau. Places like this evoke a real sense of community. I think as Flagstaff grows and matures, I think more people will seek out places like this to help them understand where they are living. What I find really special about the Arboretum at Flagstaff is that it's kind of like this oasis of biological diversity. Because we are really trying to feature native plants and we have all kinds of different nooks and crannies, if you will, to be able to do that, that helps us in being able to bring that home to uh, homeowners by showing them, like, if you have a really shady area that you can't be feeding, dry, windy area, you can really focus on these species. People can come out here and go to select areas and say, this is what my backyard looks like. I guess I can try planting these things here. Grow what you can, grow what works here. And it's, the answer is native plants. I came here in 98 and I've been here ever since. <laughs> 23 years at the Arboretum. It's kind of where I come out to relax and enjoy myself. It helps people in so many different ways. It's amazing all the things that you can get from being out in nature. And Working with the Arboretum between being on the board and being a docent and learning more about native plants and water use and fire, it just really solidified my commitment to being aware of how I was interacting with the environment. So this is, this is inspirational to me. So conservation work here at the Arboretum at Flagstaff is really kind of in three different areas. We do a lot of monitoring. The other piece that we really work a lot on is conservation of seeds. And then also surveying and looking at well, how are the different populations that we've been studying, how are they actually doing? The other side, the community um, connection and education really falls within our education programs department and really trying to make what we do in a technical sense more digestible for people on an everyday sense. And so that comes with doing workshops and outreach at community events and you know hosting classes and workshops here and having that all important interpretive signage so people can kind of self-teach. This place represents the community's biggest outdoor classroom for learners of all ages. One of the things that makes me happiest is when I'm sitting up in my office and I can look out and I see kids running all over the place and smelling the flowers and feeling the leaves and just getting in touch with nature. It really is about living 
appropriately in a certain place. Something very close to me is the Arboretum. Uh, those be um, just serving our taste for flowers and trees. It is for um, the health of native plants and what they do to serve humanity. So Frances McAllister was born Frances Burt McAllister, and she lived the first half of her life in Southern California. She was born to parents who had not graduated from high school, and she ended up almost completing a master's in philosophy. And while she was at school in UCLA, she met her, the man who would become her husband. And the first time he invited her home for dinner, she found out that he was very wealthy. <laughs> so that was kind of, it was a romantic story. And, but it was a, a sad story too, because he died after they had only been married for 20 years and she had to bring up her son as a single mother. Even though she was wealthy, she went through a lot of hard times as a single mom. When her son went off to college, she decided to make Flagstaff her forever home. She had the big stone house built and she lived there alone for 15 years. And when she reached the age of 70, she realized it was time for her to transition in her life and live in town. And she wanted to donate this building, her garden and the 200 acres surrounding it to become a botanical garden and a research center. So she created the Transition Zone Horticultural Institute, which we now call the Arboretum at Flagstaff. There is probably no single person that has had as much influence on uh, Flagstaff and Northern Arizona as Frances McAllister. And she did so on so many different levels. Um, you know, education, she was a big advocate for pre-K. She also just uh, loved the Museum of Northern Arizona. She loved science, uh, the multiculturalism of our community, the Colorado Plateau. Uh, she was very involved in uh, the arts and the sciences and uh, really as both a human being with her time and her philanthropy helped to really create a lot of the roots of the place we call home. Frances was a Quaker and the Quaker values are things like speak truth to power and um, she had a strong sense of social justice. I think Frances McAllister was one of these visionaries. She understood celebrating the beauty and diversity of, of regional places. She valued science and the role that science and the understanding of natural systems could play in benefiting our lives. She understood the concept of ecology and ecological health. She supported research in that. And she also saw the, the beauty of all of that. And she was a very big believer in the need for forest restoration and forest management. We're in the 60s and the 70s, and it was the thinning in the forest management that she and others had worked on here that saved the ARB uh, from extensive forest fire damage. She had a great connection to the land here, and she also had a great feeling of stewardship. Francis really wanted to create a place to educate the community and the visitors about the Coconino Forest and the Colorado Plateau, and particularly with an interest on early childhood learning to bring young people in and start early with, a, with an environmental consciousness and a sensitivity to the natural surroundings. I think Francis would rather be remembered as an advocate for children and for early childhood education. She was really focused on children. She spent the last 10 years of her life when she was in a wheelchair she'd go to preschools and kindergartens and see talk to the children there and that's what she would like to be remembered for
I try to do the best I can in the situation I find myself. My life is this, but I work in this office four days a week, and a good bit of it is uh, work related to institutions that I feel are working to make life better for myself and others. I'm not trying to make more money, of which I have plenty. I'm trying to use the money that I have in ways that will release other people's energies to do the best that they can do. Help them to express the beauty that they can for the benefit of the most people. You know, the Arboretum is 40 years old. And I wish I could live to see it be 100 years old or 200 years old. I, I'm sure it will evolve. It's come a long way in 40 years when she started it. Regardless of what happens around it, this is a great island of what Flagstaff should be and a great demonstration as we enter into climate change. So to protect this place, to protect that legacy, I think is what's really important. You know, you can't forget about Francis or the Arb or those historic threads of fabric that really created the place that so many people enjoy now. Down the road is Francis's original cabin that she and John built. It got moved out here. We carried her ashes here and they're spread right in front of her home. In a very real sense, Frances has never left the Arboretum. She's still very much here, very much looking over not only the last 40 years, but she is here also looking over the next 40 years here at the Ark. And I think that's, that's her legacy. Okay, I hope that was enjoyable. I've watched it about five times now and I just love it. Um, the wonderful. <laughs> so the Arboretum and its wonderful gift shop will be open through the end of October. Uh, it, look, it looked really good yesterday. I don't know what this cold front is going to do for it, but um, get out there if you can this month and you can see the art installation by chip thomas which was featured in the video chip is that um or dr thomas i should call him is that physician from tuba city who does a lot of wheat paste art and large-scale outdoor work along uh, highway 89 north and he agreed to do a piece for the arboretum in celebration of its 40th anniversary so he did the large photograph of Francis with the monarch butterfly printed on fabric, which is waving in the breeze in the Ramada at the Arboretum. So go check it out. We're open Wednesday through Sunday. You can bring your dog. And the book that I referred to many times that was my inspiration, The Journals of Francis McAllister, that has been reissued and you can order a copy from the Arboretum online if you wish, or you can buy it in person at our wonderful gift shop. And if you'd like to make donation to the Arboretum at any time, you can text GIVE to this phone number, 928-272-3790, and make a donation to the Arboretum. So thanks so much, and if anyone has a question, I'll try to answer. Thank you so much, Ellen. That was wonderful. Um, you know, I worked at the Arboretum a few years ago, and I have such wonderful memories of that. And I love the journal. I'm so excited to hear that it has been reissued. So anyone that mm -hmm. you know is from no Northern Arizona or Flagstaff, uh, highly recommended. And I'm a huge fan of Dr. Thomas, so really excited. I'm okay, yeah. um, going out, going out there this weekend to see the new art installation. So what a special treat! So Gwen was asking if the video is online, and it is not yet. Um, but, well, it will be online through the Reardon Mansion or the Northern Arizona 
historical society. <laughs> the Reardon uh, Mansion yeah. State State Park website. Yes. So hopefully by next okay. week we'll have that up and available, and uh, you can. And that's probably the only place it can be seen. It's not on YouTube, in other words. We've kind of been holding it back, I guess, because we're so proud of it. But someday it will be on YouTube. But if you want to see it again or share it with friends, uh, do what Shannon suggests and wait a week and then look at the Reardon Mansion site. But you'll have to uh, watch my PowerPoint again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, wonderful, Ellen, and thank you everybody for, for joining us today. And uh, our Arboretum's open for till the end of October before it closes down on the season. So we'll let this uh, a cold storm blow through here and uh, enjoy going out to see the Arboretum. And Ellen, thank you so much for your time, for all of your research and sharing Francis McAllister's amazing story, a real treat. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> thank you, Shannon. All right. Take good care, everybody. Have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.